Um, so let's get started. Um, welcome everyone. Happy Earth Day. I'm Leonora Kamner. I'm Executive Director of Abundant Housing LA. Um, and today I'm um, very grateful that uh, Tara Baraskis is going to be moderating for us. Tara is the Executive Director of Community Corporation of Santa Monica, a nonprofit affordable housing organization based in Santa Monica. Being in this role since 2016, she oversees the functional areas of the organization, including management of 1,800 units of affordable housing, housing development, resident services, maintenance, and administration of 80 staff. Um, Ms. Baraskas, um, or you want me to call you Tara, Ms. Baraskas? Tara's fine. <laughs> Tara. Tara has over 20 years of experience in affordable housing development having worked at both for-profit and non-profit affordable housing development organizations before joining Community Corporation. Tara holds a bachelor's degree in English from California State University, Long Beach, and a lead AP accreditation from the U.S. Green Building Council. She currently serves as chair of the board of directors for the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. In addition, she serves on the board of the Santa Monica Bay Area Human Relations Council and the board of Downtown Santa Monica, Inc., so I'm going to turn it over to you now, Tara, to do the introduction. And thank you so much again for moderating this. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Leonora. And uh, it's great to see everyone here. Happy Earth Day. Before we get started, I'm going to put up a um, native land acknowledgement, and then I'll go ahead and read it out. Just give me a moment. To all our relations, we the settlers of this land honor the Keech, Tongva, and Chumash peoples who are the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the land that now encompasses the greater Los Angeles area. We are grateful. May we be good guests upon your land. We acknowledge the harms of genocide, enslavement, forced assimilation, gender violence, destruction of sacred sites, and burial of historic truth about indigenous suffering at the hands of US colonial settlerism. We apologize for the harm by pledging ourselves to be part of a culture of repair. Let us join our hearts to the protection of sacred sites and villages, as well as indigenous people who live among us. Okay, and um, so we'll go ahead and get started. We have an exciting panel for you all today. Um, it being Earth Day, the theme of today is going to be sustainability and innovation with regards to affordable housing. And we'll talk a little bit about that intersection and I think you'll all find it really interesting. And so I'm going to start out by just introducing this topic a little bit and um, hold on, let me just go back to my, oh, I guess I have to, stop and reshare. Hold on just one moment. I apologize. All right. So first I thought um, it might be interesting just to know a little bit about the origins of Earth Day and, and why this intersects with the work that we do. Um, for those of you that don't know, Earth Day started in 1970, and it was started by Senator Gaylord Nelson, who really um, wanted to see people take a more active role in protecting the environment. And he was particularly in love with this river that you see behind you, which was a St. Croix River. Um, and 20 million people mobilized for that event. Um, and obviously, we all know now, um, you know, We've got people all around the country, millions of people that celebrate Earth Day, but really the origins of it were um, justice and environmental activism. And let me see if this is gonna work for me, hold on. Oh, here we go. So um, why talk about affordable housing on Earth Day? Well, the built environment is actually a very large contributor to greenhouse gas emission um, and climate change. Um, buildings account for almost 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions um, between the operation of buildings and also materials and construction. Now, not all of that is affordable housing, but obviously all the built environment plays a role. In addition to that, we have a very severe unaffordability crisis in LA County and you've all seen sort of the progression of the unaffordability play out in terms of um, homelessness and people having to move out of state or double up in units. And this is just a little um, illustration of how unaffordable 
it is to live here. You know, right now you would have to be making, you know, $66 an hour, which is four times the minimum wage in order to purchase a home in LA County, or you would need to make, you know, $42 an hour to be able to rent an average apartment, which is obviously well above minimum wage as well. So clearly there's quite a large affordability gap. And, and that's the reason that you're going to be hearing from some people about affordable housing and why it's so important. So, um, you know, housing justice really is climate justice and racial justice. Um, we frequently find that the people who live in affordable housing, the lower income people tend to be more people of color, tend to be people who have come from disadvantaged circumstances and have often um, been victims to um, environmental issues, living in substandard units, um, you know, uh, substandard housing environments, I guess I would say. And so all of this comes together in affordable housing and that's why we all do the work. We want to do our part to not only reduce, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, but also to improve the, the life circumstances of people who have been marginalized and disadvantaged. And we'll, we'll probably get into that topic a little bit more during our panel discussion. Um, so just wanted to share with you a little bit about how affordable housing really can be beautiful, it can be highly sustainable, and it, it can be, um, you know, a model for other types of development. So, you know, we typically at Community Corp are putting solar panels on our buildings. Right now we're looking at putting solar panels on our entire portfolio of almost 100 buildings, and um, we're working with Tim on that, so it's kind of an exciting venture. And um, we also um, really focus a lot on fresh food access, um, green um, gardens, um, programming surrounding gardens, and healthy ways of living. Um, so, well, that's me, but here to introduce, <laughs> I'm here to introduce some wonderful panelists who are all experts in a a slightly different perspective, but all sort of around this general topic of housing justice. So um, with us today, um, we have Fernanda Opperman, who's a principal at Mutuo Architects. We have Tim Kohut, who's a director of sustainable design at National Core. We have Robin Hughes, who's the president and CEO of Abode Communities and is an icon of the affordable housing industry. And we have Alan Sutton, who um, is a retired filmmaker and also now currently very actively involved with LA Can. And each of the panelists will tell you a little bit more about themselves um, as we begin this discussion. So we're gonna go ahead and um, start off with Fernanda and each um, panelist will speak for a little bit and then we're going to have a group conversation and then we'll open it up for questions and answers afterwards. Um, so Fernanda. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Tara. Um, Jose, if you can share this the slides. Let's see if Jose will start. Great, thank you so much. So my name is Fernanda Opperman. I'm a principal at Mutuo. And uh, Mutuo is an architecture studio based in LA, um, looking for ways in, in which architecture can create social change. Next, Jose. So I'm going to talk about today, about the, the research into affordable by design housing typologies that we are doing. Um, we have uh, developed a couple systems that could be used as additional tools in building faster and cheaper housing units. So next was that. So I think I would first like to make a distinction between affordable housing uh, which is the term to refer, that refers to publicly uh, subsidized housing and, um, and housing that's affordable for low-income individuals and family. Um, so for uh, affordable housing, uh, we have like use of public subsidies. Um, it is a little bit more costly to build than a st standard unit. And by standard unit, I mean a unit you, you would uh, build without, without the public subsidies. Um, it's like a niche market with specialized developers and architects, um, and it usually creates larger developments. Um, when we talk about affordable by design, what we mean is like privately funded. Um, the goal is to cost less than wood framing construction, so the standard unit. Um, 
it's available, it should be available to a wider pool of developers and designers um, because it's uh, privately funded. Um, and it's uh, smaller developments uh, woven into the fabric of the city. Next. And here are our, our goals with the typologies that we design. So that they are affordable by design, that they promote environmental sustainability and social equity, that they use construction resources that are available, but in novel ways, um, that there is flexibility for a variety of building configurations and to promote compact living closer to city centers, also a sustainable uh, issue. Next one. So uh, my, my business partner, Jose Herasti, and I, is from Mexico and I am from Brazil. Uh, we look back at our experiences and observations while growing up in our countries, being immersed in a more flexible and organic system of urban growth. And we try to take some lessons that can be tried in the US. We just wonder if there could be a happy medium between informal settlements and excessive building regulations. Next one, Jose. Uh, so this is the first system I would like to share with you guys uh, that we that we are developing. Um, it's further along uh, in the process and hopefully getting built this year. Um, this is a monolithic system. Uh, Jose, next one. Uh, this is a monolithic system that minimizes construction layers. Each concrete box is a module of 10 feet wide by eight feet deep by 10 feet tall interior dimensions. Um, the configurations could be increased module by module, 80 feet at a time. Each concrete box covert works as a structure, interior and exterior finishes as an and as matte foundation. This is a pilot plan that was permitted as an ADU, uh, accessory dwelling unit by the city of LA for a lot in Boyle Heights, five minutes from downtown LA. Four modules will be craned into place to assemble the unit in a few hours, creating a micro unit of 320 square feet interior. Next one, Jose. So we approach sustainability in this project in a broader context. It starts with the non-displacement of existing tenants and retaining existing structures. Um, when the developer uh, purchased this land uh, in Boyle Heights, there was a fourplex on the site and the opportunity to build more units. So we are using this sliver of land to the right um, to uh, propose uh, five micro units in a tower configuration. Um, so this, is, this project is entitled, entitled with smaller setbacks, additional height, waived parking requirements, it's very close to obtaining building permits, uh, and we look we are looking into starting construction of it in uh, 2021. Next one, Jose. This box is, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about how the system works. These boxes are fabricated off-site by, by a manufacturer that uses reusable and adjustable formwork with higher strength concrete and when parts of the cement product, product is substituted by other binders, for example, natural clay or fly ash, which is a byproduct of coal and uh, fired power plants. So um, the shell is, mo is, is monolithic, so it's concrete, so it's durable. And in, in contrast with the layered assemblies, it's can, it can be easily disassembled and reused and in the end of life, the concrete can be ground to be recycled into new concrete. Um, we, as we develop this, uh, we have thought a lot about uh, like monolithic materials and what else could be used in this case. Um, and, and because concrete is not a material that ne necessarily comes to mind when you think about sustainability. Um, in large part because of the amount of energy that's required to produce uh, Portland cement, which is this binder of the concrete. So, but we believe the intrinsic qualities of the monolithic material, uh, the concrete as a monolithic material, uh, offer sustainability gains on other ends. Um, 
The concrete industry is also thinking of ways to become incrementally more sustainable and reach carbon neutral concrete by 2050. Um, for people that are interested in how uh, concrete can become more sustainable, there is a good resource, uh, uh, an MIT CS hub, which is a great research group at MIT dedicated to improving the sustainability of concrete production and use. Um, next one, Jose. So uh, structurally, our boxes are stitched together through embedded and welded steel connections. One of our biggest challenges in cost is the site work and foundation giving the narrow steep lot. Um, we step the boxes with the sites to minimize excavation to, to help with that. And the cost of construction per unit for this project stacking the box is about twice the cost of the ADU pilot plan because of the site work. Next one, Hassan. So being inserted in, in Boyle Heights, this project in Boyle Heights, a community with a strong tradition rooted in the Chicano art movement and its murals, we worked with an artist, uh, Latin artist, Miguel Nobrega, uh, to design a mural for the facade of the building. Next one, Jose. This other project, uh, this other system um, uses different materials. Um, it's, a, it's called, it's a panelized system and we call it DUO, Jose, next one. And uh, so this is for, this happened following the adoption of the statewide ADU policy, which allows for single family residences to add a second unit to their backyard. We talked about the system of prefabricated panels um, that can be transported to, through narrow side, side, yards more, side yards more easily. Um, one challenge to building prefabricated ADUs is the different configurations of the backyards. So uh, this system can be reconfigured in many different ways using predetermined panels, uh, the same predetermined panels. Um, and the system should be built without the need of heavy machinery. Next one, Jose. So we started this design for the system with a traditional house volume, 20 by 20 feet with four basic parts, bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, and living. And we call them essential parts for living. These parts can be rotated and assembled in different configurations, creating a variety of forms and plans. There is flexibility in size since the parts can be added incrementally. Next one, Jose. This diagram shows a traditional house volume with four essential parts of living as a micro unit of 400 square feet. The design is based on a determined amount of pre-cut panels that create varied designs. The system also builds on the idea of diminishing the amount of layers necessary for construction, something we have been pursuing. Uh, we use an existing SIPS panels, structurally insulated panels, which are available. Um, and they are cut to specific sizes. SIPS panels, which you see the, the image on the side, um, is um, SIPS panels are sustainable because they create a building envelope that are high, have high thermal resistance and minimal air infiltration. Um, the major components for SIPS panels take less energy uh, and raw materials to produce than other structural building systems. There is less material waste because it's cut in the factory. Um, and SIPs can be assembled in less time than st standard wood framing construction. So as part of this, uh, our research, we are now looking into sustainable waterproofing liquids that could work as exterior finish and another interior finish that can also be applied in the factory. That way each panel would be already structurally insulated with interior and exterior finishes when transported to the site. Um, next one, Jose. So this is an, an exploration on ways uh, that we can expand the module, uh, even creating multifamily buildings. Next one. This is a project for a four unit uh, village site in LA County. Um, in all of our projects, we look for ways to create, to build community with uh, common spaces. 
So here there is a trade-off between the small interior spaces, but also with uh, communal spaces accessible to all the units. Um, next one, Jose. So during the past five years researching and developing the systems that you know still haven't come to full fruition because it's not built yet, but um, we have been researching and developing and, and, and there has been a, a good amount of, of um, okay, a challenge as I will be covering very quickly, just two slides. So it's funding for research and development of new housing typologies that it's, we have to fund basically, like we, we have this, the luck to find a developer, but it was, has been very uh, heavily funded by us. Um, developers' willingness to try an uh, innovative system because there is risk for them. Finding the right manufacturer has been huge for us too. We have done a lot of work on that. Uh, obtaining city permits for a new system can be tricky and finding a flexible builder willing to build differently, it's also a challenge in this. That's the next one. So we just hope to inspire a conversation about flexibility in housing systems. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tara. Tim is going to speak next. Thanks, Fernanda. That was really interesting, and I have a lot of questions, but <laughs> um, we'll wait until we hear all the presentations, and I think we'll have a very robust conversation. Um, so thanks again. Very interesting. Um, all right, next we're going to go to Tim with National Core. Tim, you're on mute. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, I'm here having a conversation. Can you see my screen? Yes, <laughs> uh, I hope so. Can you hear me? Uh, so I want to just uh, kind of do a lay of the land where where uh, we see the affordable housing industry today. And uh, I'm living this um, perpetual lifetime experiment that says that if we can prove that we can build high efficiency, zero net energy and ultimately carbon neutral affordable housing um, on our budgets, anybody can do this. And we've taken a lot of strides as a state in the last um, really 13 years or so as we charted the course towards zero net energy and, and people thought it was impossible uh, to get there. And now we're there and we're moving beyond it. And we're talking about things that are, are moving the rest of the country and I think the rest of the world. So um, I want to try to paint a picture of where the work that we do kind of fits into this conversation, I hope helps to move people in um, the right direction. Um, National Community Renaissance, where I am uh, Director of Sustainable Design, is uh, a uh, developer and builder of affordable housing we develop, we build. I actually, I'm an architect. I'm a certified energy analyst. Um, I work under the construction wing at National Corps. So we actually build our affordable housing. So we're sort of intimate to conversations about um, things like cost containment and high performance. We get to wire those conversations into everything we do every day. Uh, when we finish building, we, we manage them and uh, we uh, go out and find uh, people who are in need of uh, housing in the areas that we serve, and we um, provide ongoing resident services to them. So we are sort of um, full service and, you know, sort of married to these communities for, for, uh, for life. Um, we're deep believers in sustainability for a variety of reasons. I'll try to get into them as I go through the presentation, but um, we are the lone uh, affordable housing developer named uh, by the U.S. Green Building Council as a power builder, um, a distinction they give to about a dozen or so uh, developers and builders across the country every year for exemplary work in affordable in, in green uh, and sustainable uh, building. And we are the lone affordable housing developer on that list. And uh, we've been on the list two years in a row, and I anticipate we'll get there uh, this year as well. Uh, National Community Renaissance is the first non-architectural entity to uh, actually sign on to the AIA 2030 commitment. Um, you know, speaking of the uh, goals that we have for zero net energy, uh, Architecture 2030 set the standards for hitting uh, goals for energy reduction back in 2006. Um, the AIA recently in December named Ed Masria, uh, CEO and founder of Architecture 2030 as their gold medal 
recipient, which uh, meant a lot to those of us who worked in the trenches on this and those of us who, who know the people over at Architecture 2030. So we, this means that we actually set these goals early on and we build to these and we monitor and we measure. So we don't just show up and put pretty pictures on a wall and try to build something, put a plaque on the wall and walk away. We, we design, influence, uh, build, occupy, measure and operate to meet these high standards. Um, I, the, the point of my discussion is really, uh, it's not about, you know, Earth Day is a great moment to kind of pause and take a deep breath and find out where you are. But what I really want to drive home is in these conversations, and I'll, I'll end with where we are today. Um, for us in affordable housing, it really needs to be about economics. And while, you know, I will tell people over and over again that, um, that you know, I am a a pure environmentalist and that I believe that the climate crisis is real. I don't win any arguments by telling people that that's important. And that's why we should be doing the things we do um, in affordable housing and anywhere. I, I, I win the battles because I understand the economics behind sustainability and energy efficiency. Um, the slide I have up here is, is important. It's, uh, it's a little bit nerdy for guys like me. Uh, who like to talk about the stuff, it's the Swanson effect. And this says that every time that uh, worldwide um, production capacity to produce photovoltaic panels doubles, the cost of uh, PVs when you wanna buy them drops by 20%. And it's really nifty if you look at it, but, but it's really exciting when you build year after year and you buy solar every year. And every year that you put on more solar, the price keeps going down. Um, and that's happening. We're, we're way past what we call grid parity, the point at which the cost from, for buying electricity from your own rooftop is cheaper than it is to buy it from the grid. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples. This is San Isidro Senior Village, 51 units of housing for the formerly homeless, uh, you know, right on the, the, uh, the border of San Diego and Mexico. We opened this about a year ago. And, and you know, as you can see, when I went in, I said, we've got to load this thing up with as much PV as we possibly can. This is Day Creek Villas. This is 140 units of senior housing in Rancho Cucamonga, it opened about four months ago. Um, and this is zero net energy electricity. Electricity It still has uh, natural gas for heating hot water. So it's a mixed fuel building. Um, this one was, was not conceived originally as an as any building, but uh, in advance of the 2019 energy code, which pushed everybody into zero net energy, um, we understood the economic tipping point and that it was actually, again, cheaper for us to buy electricity from ourselves, even if we had to finance this. Um, so we loaded up and this project is zero net energy and our residents are now enjoying electricity bills of about 10 bucks a month. And our common areas are a couple hundred bucks a month as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars. This is, this is what I really stare at. You know, I'm, I'm an energy analyst. I, you know, I'm an architect. Um, I tell people that when I go into a room to talk about affordable housing, I guarantee you I'm the cheapest guy in the room. I have to understand this stuff to order to sell the package. This is the energy profile for San Isidro Senior Village, uh, you know, 51 units. It's got a, a 91 kW uh, PV system on the roof. The green is, is that all the electricity that's coming from the sun and hitting the panels and the blue underneath is our our grid provided PV. And we just ran out of roof space on this one. And we, we didn't quite conceive it from day one to be zero net energy, but we got pretty damn close. And what this means to us, when, when you're a developer and an operator of affordable housing, you have to anticipate that you're gonna be paying your electricity bills. So the electricity bills on this were in the area before PV about $56,000. And by strapping the PV onto the roof, we dropped our operating uh, electricity costs down to $9,200 a year, um, a saving of $47,000 a year. And you know, it's a special needs project, so it's master metered, so we're paying for everything. So this really adds up. So again, I'm calling this one out. If you remember one slide, this is the most important slide I'm gonna show you. Um, what does $47,000 a year look like over the life of a conventional loan? You're, you're, uh, area under the blue triangle there is our, what I would call your annuity payments to the electricity company. If you decide to grid tie your electricity, they're gonna increase every single year. Last year, the electricity cost in SoCal Edison territory went up about 7%. We, we bought our rooftop energy at, for about $200,000 and those costs are locked. So the question is for 51 units and $2 million of operational savings, what can you do with that savings? Right. This is this is the conversation. Do you do you want to do something with it? Do you want to 
subsidize transportation? Do you want to provide another resident services coordinator? Do you want to teach yoga classes? Do you uh, want to prepay your or repay all of your city loans faster? Maybe the cities will like you better. So um, it's, it's not just new construction, though. It, it's got to be about understanding our existing buildings. And many of our projects in the affordable housing community are turnkey. You build them, you put the plaque on the wall, people move in and people forget about them. We don't do that. We stare at our, our operational revenues and our performance over time. And I'll, I'll tell you why it's important in just a second. We spend about $1.2 million a year on, on electricity uh, for common areas in our portfolio. We spend about $648,000 in natural gas. And we spend about $3.23 million a year in water. So we're monitoring this on a regular basis. And what's going on right now in our portfolio is the state has put out these massive rebates, solar on multifamily affordable housing. If you're an affordable housing developer, you have to get into this game and you have to do it in full force. You can't do one project. You got to do 50. Um, you got to take the money while it's there because the rebates are going to go away and they're going to diminish. So we're in the middle of, I think we are the, the biggest recipient of some uh, uh, rebate money right now. We're in the middle of installing 15 megawatts of PV. That's a lot of PV. We're leveraging about $20 million worth of rebates. Um, and without uh, coming out of pocket with any money at all, uh, our residents are gonna get near zero electricity bills, a good thing. And our own common area electricity costs are going down by at least 40%. So this is out there. This is a program that exists today. And I was talking to one of the SOMA administrators yesterday and they were saying, not enough people are getting into this. Why aren't more people getting into this um, in the affordable housing community? Now, I, I, I don't know. Can you I, you know that? <laughs> yeah, you, I don't know, Tara, maybe a little bit of fear, maybe a little suspicion or just people are overwhelmed. But you, know, um, you guys are now looking at it. I know, Tara, that you're gonna hopefully dive in and do your portfolio. Just, just take the money. Right, um, yeah. And, and Tim, I, we do need to wrap your section here, but, you know, I, and, you know, I'd be interested in Robin's perspective on this too, but um, certainly we just don't have the bandwidth to manage the kind of rebate processing that, that um, you're doing at National Core. So really, you know, a lot of nonprofits and, you know, even some for-profits are running pretty lean and mean, and we just don't have staff capacity. That's, that's my answer as to why we're not doing it. And that's why we're, you know, going to outsource some of that so that we can take advantage of these really amazing opportunities. So, so uh, let me leave you with these slides then. Okay. And I'll wrap it up in 30 seconds uh, okay. without doing anything in our portfolio, without even looking at SOMA yet uh, in the last five years, just by paying attention to energy efficiency, national core's carbon footprint has gone down by about 10%, about 1.2 million pounds. At the same time, our operating costs have gone down about $321,000. This is before we even talk about SOMA. So what can you do with those operational savings? You know, I challenge you. And I'd, I'd ask you to take a look at the things that are coming, including discussions now about banning natural gas in the 2022 Energy Code. Really controversial discussion there. Uh, uh, we caught some heat in the LA Times for going out on a limb and, and saying it's important. And this is what came out today. Right. This is what we're talking about now, a 50% reduction in, in CO2 emissions in the next 10 years. And people are going to say that this is absolutely crazy. But I just tell them, come to California and see what we're doing in the world of affordable housing. It's possible. That's awesome, Tim. And we look forward to diving in more. And I, I think part of it, too, is I don't really know if people really feel um, the climate emergency the way that some of us may. And the fact that we all need to keep the global warming under two degrees. and this is exactly how you do it. And unfortunately it's pretty drastic and it has to happen. So um, so anyway, look forward to diving in more about that. But um, why don't we go ahead and, and talk to Robin about what's happening over at Abode. Since we've been chatting, I lost my presentation. So let me find it. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, so as I'm, uh, that's very weird. Um, so as we're talking, uh, again, my name is Robin Hughes and I am the president and CEO of Abode Communities. I am really excited to say this year I am celebrating my 25th anniversary um, as the head of Abode Communities. So wonderful. Wow, wonderful. congratulations. <laughs> so, of course, I started when I was 25 too. So. <laughs> um, That's amazing. So, uh, you know, Bode, I will say, Tim, it's always really hard to follow you because of your, your passion about sustainability and in particular um, um, the work that you're doing at National, at National Corps. So 
I believe I am there as I'm chatting away. <laughs> um, so abode communities, we are a uh, nonprofit architecture development and uh, property management organization. And um, uh, we've been around for almost 53 years, but in the space of doing affordable housing development uh, since the mid uh, 1980s. Um, and so, you know, our commitment uh, to sustainability goes way back, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge and uh, thank Tim for his leadership uh, during his tenure at Abode Communities. Uh, you know, very, very early, we looked at sustainability in, in our work uh, and our design. And, um, you know, I'm proud to say that we, why do I keep doing that? Sorry, guys, <laughs> that we are, um, you know, proud to say that Abode Communities is uh, the, is uh, we have, um, sorry, I hope I'm gonna do this right this time. I keep on sharing. I'm gonna stop talking and focus. You probably can't really multitask. <laughs> you wanna share the, you know, the, the PowerPoint too. Like we can still see it that way, even if it's not full screen, so. Yeah. Like if you want to just do it that way, that that works too. There we go. Um, sorry about that, guys. All right, there we go. Um, so, uh, so I'm, you know, really proud to say, you know, this slide really just highlights, I think, some of the key things that are important for us as an organization. You know, the first is really about how we, uh, you know, how we are sort of an economic driver in the communities that we serve. So it's really important to look at, you know, how much investment we have made in low income uh, and emerging communities. Uh, and in addition on the, uh, the middle here is sort of the number of people that we are able to serve and touch within uh, our affordable housing developments touching over uh, 10,000 uh, residents within our portfolio. And then um, the last box on the corner here is that we're really proud of being having um, a, a, a state recognition as being the owner of the highest number of multifamily um, uh, rental units that are platinum, lead platinum. So that's a really uh, thing that uh, important thing for us as an organization. But what I want to talk about and share with you today is one of the things that Abode Community prides herself on is sort of being in the leading edge uh, around things, uh, whether it's finance, design, uh, or construction. And so I know many of you who are uh, in the, the Zoom gallery over probably the last three decades, we keep hearing about modular construction and how modular construction can be, can deliver um, affordable housing, less expensive and more quickly. And uh, in an environment where construction costs and our overall total development cost is kindly is constantly being uh, frowned upon, criticized. Uh, as an organization, we're like, we have to do proof of concept. How do we either determine that this is a method that's going to work and reduce cost, or we can sort of pack it away and say it's not, but let's let's make a commitment to proof of concept. And it came from uh, the, uh, the HHH affordable housing challenge uh, in the city of Los Angeles. So not only about producing housing more quickly, but also getting our unhoused uh, neighbors into housing more quickly. So abode communities partner with, um, with uh, LA Family Housing and Mercy Housing to respond to this challenge. And we received a uh, $40 million HHH award to implement the strategy that we feel is very innovative, but creates a collaboration between our three organizations, along with uh, Factory OS and the California Community Foundation. So um, what we are doing as a collaboration is thinking about how do we streamline and standardize uh, the development of permanent supportive housing so that we can uh, create um, more efficient units uh, more quickly. And what we want in our, our construction approach is using modular units. One of the things that I'll also talk about is this revolving loan fund that we've set up in order to deal with that, that pre-construction phase of getting the work done. 
and that we wanted to do something that was going to be re replicable and scalable. Um, and so we started with this sort of streamlined approach of how do we standardize site selection? And we really targeted sites that we could do by right, that were um, transit oriented, that were configured in the right way that uh, made modular construction the, the most uh, efficient as possible. We also said we're going to come up with a standardized uh, uh, unit layout that we will use across all of these projects that we're building as a team. Uh, and that in addition, we're use, utilizing the same architecture studio, which happens to be a Bode Communities architecture. So by coming up with some of these standards ways, standardized ways of doing uh, our work, taking advantage of streamlining um, land use uh, opportunities in the city of Los Angeles, we're really hoping to reduce even just some of that upfront pre-development and entitlement work. The other thing that we realized there was a gap in financing uh, for construction. So as um, folks may or may not know, in order to get the factory started with um, our modular work um, um, in, the, in the factory, we have to pay a deposit before the construction actually starts on the site and before we close our construction loan. And right now there's not, um, that capital is not available within the private market. So with some of the proceeds from the HHH award as well as leveraging other dollars, we're creating this revolving internal revolving loan fund so that we can utilize it to make those deposit pre uh, construction loan program closing and we'll um, uh, sort of revolve it over time for the five or six projects that we will ultimately work on. And then the, the hope is that by standardizing site selection, design and modular construction, we can definitely reduce our overall time, be able to replicate and scale something that is, that is cost effective. So, um, you know, during this process, I had the opportunity to go up and visit the OS factory up in Vallejo, and I was um, stunned by the efficiency in which they uh, operate their facility. Uh, and it truly is a kit of part in a box. You basically get uh, for your 50, 60 affordable housing unit development, you know, each unit is assembled and in a box for, down to the actual appliances. And it's a it's sort of real well-run um, modular construction site. So, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, you know, one of the reasons we appreciate this approach is that um, as it compares to um, our traditional construction, uh, we think it's just a more sustainable method too. We are, you know, there will be less waste on the construction side. There will be energy con conservation, lowering our carbon emission, you know, much safer working environment for the, the workers. I was just, you know, really surprised by how, you know, instead of doing gymnastics with their body, just how being able to do this in a safe contained environment, um, they were, it, it just felt so much safer than a typical construction site. And, they, and again, we're just um, feeling like it has so many efficiencies that um, it produces a product that is more environmentally friendly. friendly. So from a construction standpoint, in terms of being able to uh, affect our time, this is just a really simple um, uh, uh, representation of where we'll see uh, savings in construction time. So, you know, traditional affordable housing development, we, you know, we have to do, you know, all of our site work and then we begin uh, to construct the units by doing this approach, we're able, and that, you know, can take, you know, anywhere up to, you know, 18, sometimes 20 months. Um, with the um, modular offsite construction uh, opportunity, we uh, can, can sort of begin both our site work and our unit construction at the same time, you know, thus reducing our overall construction period, um, you know, by you know, up to, you know, four or five months. Um, and, you know, as we do our current analysis, uh, this, this slide just really shows, you know, what we're expecting to see in overall savings, both in time and money. Um, so from this uh, challenge effort between our three organizations, we will, uh, we have five, six sites under site control now. We hope to produce about 360 uh, permanent supportive housing units. 
and we hope to sort of reduce the overall time for our traditional affordable housing, which can take up to 55 months from site control to completion, to reduce that down to 24 months and to take our, you know, our per unit cost on a project um, from 20, uh, 525 per unit to about 430 per unit. So saving a savings in the construction at about 18% and the overall timeline uh, about 53%. Uh, so I just want to show you an example of one of the projects that we that Abode Communities is working on in this pro in this process. And I think one of the things that I appreciate about this this particular uh, elevation is that oftentimes we think of modular uh, prefab housing, and we think how how is that going to impact the integrity of the design? And again, what we are learning through this process is, you know, perhaps you don't get all the great articulation uh, in your elevation, but we can still produce um, well-designed affordable housing in the work that we do. So this particular site is in uh, San Pedro, and we call it Beacon Landing because it's on Beacon. Uh, and, you know, it'll be, um, you know, 90 units uh, or, or 89 units of permanently support, permanent supportive housing uh, with really ample open space. Uh, but this is an example of sort of a really efficient, uh, these are all sort of studio units um, that we will have in this, uh, in this development. So that is sort of the typical uh, standard um, unit plan. And, um, you know, this is just a sort of overall layout. So on the left of the screen, uh, is the is the ground floor. So we're accommodating a really great open space on this side, but the um, you know community uses up on top is a community uh, room. The orange color are the uh, property management offices and then other sort of general space. And then the yellow uh, is the um, offices for the case managers to deliver permanent supportive housing. And then we sort of efficiently, efficiently then lay out the units on the, the second, third, uh, and fourth floor. So very efficient layout. And this is just uh, more open space. So, um, you know, we're excited. So in addition to doing Beacon Landing and these five projects with um, Mercy Housing and LA Family Housing, Abode Communities has committed to uh, doing modular construction on three other uh, permanent supportive housing projects within our own portfolio. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think we'll start the first project next year. So we'll see over the next three years uh, whether, we not, whether or not we have proof of concept and whether or not we have something that we can scale. So thank you. Very interesting, Robin. Thanks so much. And um, what was the name of the factory that you're building in? Uh, factory OS. They're up in Vallejo. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because we're also um, designing a project modular right now and we're not seeing those kind of cost savings. But I think maybe if you pool together multiple projects, then you can start to see the cost saving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, we are definitely going to want to talk about that a little bit more, but why don't we first hear from Alan? Go ahead, Alan. So I'm going to get us started for Alan by sharing um, the video of EcoHood as he requested. So okay, uh, I'm gonna do that now and I need to make sure the sound And then works. afterwards we will um, leave some time for Q&A. So feel free to type your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box. Hi, I'm super excited to be here at the EcoHood future home site here in South Central LA. As you can see right now, it looks like a lot of pretty amazing piles of upturned soil and native plants, but this will be the future home of sustainable housing to create a community of folks who are able to live with one another in a way that is sustainable and that is powerful for them. Um, so this would be a perfect area to till it and level it out and make some raised garden beds, some Google culture garden beds that you pile natural materials on top of each other in order to create a type of lasagna garden that as it decomposes, nourishes the soil. So whenever you're growing food, the most important part of growing food is soil health, of course. So we want to ensure that all garden beds have a healthy foundation, just like all humans. The really incredible thing about 
growing a community in this space is that it can be a very high touch gardening experience. So a lot of people feel really removed from their food sources. So you go to a market and you just purchase food and you don't know where it comes from or who grew it. But the difference with this community is that putting the seed into the soil as a community, you'll learn the life cycle of a plant. You'll learn how a plant go grows, what it takes to tend to, to tend to a plant and be able to harvest it from seed to sprout and share it with your community. Um, and also here we have an avocado tree. So everybody knows that growing your own food is good for you. It's good to have nice, fresh, organic, healthy produce in your backyard. But there's also the mind-body connection. So everybody has this innate need to tend to things. It's important to find your place in life by having something that kind of relies on you day after day. So I think that that's one of the most incredible things about growing your own food, is these individuals that are gonna live in this community will be able to see their plant grow up and will be able to walk outside every day and say, hey, this is what my tomato needs today, and hey, this is what this lettuce needs, and really put their hands into the soil and really become a part of that life cycle of the plant. And then when it's time to harvest the vegetable, they know exactly what went into it, exactly what went into the soil, how it was watered, how it was tended to, and sharing that food in that sense just gives you an incredible sense of resiliency, an incredible sense of purpose, and overall permanency. It lets the world know that this isn't just a housing community where you can kick us out at any time. This isn't just a hodgepodge of tents on the sidewalk. These are folks who are committed to putting their actual physical roots down in this soil and making a place for themselves. Okay, um, Alan, I'm moving over to your slides now. So actually, let me fix the screen share. Um, okay, Alan, if you wanna, if you wanna unmute, um, I've got your slides ready. Okay, uh, uh, well, thanks. Um, I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here on behalf of uh, LA CAN or the Los Angeles Community Action Network to speak about Ecohood, uh, their sustainable housing prototype development in South Central LA. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the history of how a Skid Row based nonprofit became a property developer, uh, get into a, a brief discussion of how uh, we're able to do it cheaper and quicker, and uh, also discuss our uh, nascent uh, effort in sustainability. Um, this has been a, a really um, uh, a great uh, uh, thing for me to participate in so far because it gave so many uh, uh, ideas of things that we can incorporate as we continue to develop our property. Um, so just uh, real quickly, uh, Ecohood is a uh, community-driven housing model based on energy-efficient homes with small footprints. Uh, it's really the uh, latest extension of LA CAN's home uh, housing work. Uh, we um, have been engaged in preserving and improving extremely low care housing since its inception and based on that vision, that, based on the vision that housing is a, a human right. Um, however, this is, the, this is the first time that LA CAN has been a developer and it's a role that was undertaken, uh, frankly, due to uh, the city's inaction. And uh, early on, we decided to um, focus on what we call a, a compact green community, uh, for want of a better term. Uh, the decision to explore alternative methods to uh, alleviate the housing shortage here in LA actually began with the passage of Proposition Triple H, um, which LA can um, put, uh, work hard to put on the ballot with a massive phone bank uh, operation and uh, uh, a lot of community outreach. We were actually drawn to the, uh, the city's, uh, what they call the comprehensive uh, homeless strategy, which is the uh, blueprint for implementing uh, HHH spending, and specifically its recommendation to allow for micro units for homeless people. 
Uh, but uh, LA's elected officials never um, moved on this particular recommendation, even as cities across America had successfully established micro home communities to optimize the use of scarce land and make housing more affordable. So despite million, billions in, in state and voter approved tax measures to build more housing, uh, the city's homeless population continued to increase by double digits as we were researching what was dubbed the tiny homes movement. Uh, we called on manufactured housing firms in Bakersfield and San Diego, and we toured uh, Community First Village in Austin, Texas. Uh, this is a 51 acre planned community that provides affordable permanent housing and supportive community for men and women coming out of chronic homelessness. Uh, in fact, it's created such a welcoming uh, environment that residents uh, now can rent their homes on Airbnb. Recently, a community first resident moved into the first 3D printed tiny home, which was built by Austin-based advanced construction technology, technologies company, uh, Icon. And uh, along with staffers from former LA City Council President Herb Wesson's office, and a building and safety official and a construction industry union leader, we were given a tutorial on the 3D printing process at, at ICON headquarters. Um, and it, in one of the, the most dramatic examples, uh, they actually um, had a, a, a 3D printed uh, housing wall set up and uh, invited us to take a, a sledgehammer and give our most powerful hit to it. And it didn't even dent it. So they're, they're extremely durable, and there's uh, uh, really um, it, it's becoming quite apparent that uh, it will really play a big role in shaping the future of housing, uh, not only uh, in the U.S. but uh, around the world. Uh, last year, LA can acquired a vacant lot not far from Los Angeles Southwest College, but shortly after we began prepping the site, all activity came to a halt due to the pandemic. So currently, we're restarting work on preparing the lot while securing the micro home supply chain um, where the pandemic has also brought higher prices and a longer delivery time. So we're having to, to, to juggle um, when the units will be available and hopefully time our uh, site preparations to uh, fit the delivery schedules. Um, some other factors that, that shaped the, uh, the uh, project um, were uh, unlike the, uh, the skyrocketing cost of housing in LA, uh, we noticed early on that innovative approaches, including prefabricated, modular, shipping containers, and mobile RVs could be developed at a fraction of the cost and much quicker than traditional construction. Uh, also, um, advancements in the technology and manufacturing uh, made it possible to build smaller homes that are structurally sound and uh, architecturally compatible, if you will, with any neighborhood. Uh, which is kind of contrary to the nimbious claim that micro homes are inferior dwellings that bring down property values. Um, so uh, in a nutshell, LA Can's Ecohood pilot project incorporates two current housing trends, downsizing and climate friendly. Uh, combining micro homes with solar power and other energy performance features, including the Skywell atmospheric water generator, which takes air what takes in air through condensation and then creates water from air, uh, EcoHood will provide stable housing for those in need, cheaper and faster while preserving the environment. Thanks to a donor who contributed the half acre plus size lot, LA can avoided one of the major costs of housing development, um, which of course is land. Uh, each of our one bedroom and two bedroom prefabricated housing units includes a bathroom with shower, a full kitchen, washer dryer stack, and living area. And of course, the five figure price tag is uh, substantially uh, less than that of uh, traditional um, construction. Uh, the other great thing is um, in working with the, uh, the uh, modular uh, construction companies, uh, we found that there was a lot of flexibility uh, in respect to floor plans. Uh, for example, uh, a number of the um, uh, mobile RV units have uh, loft bedrooms. So there's a, a living area, bathroom area, kitchen, and then the loft is upstairs. Uh, but we uh, really didn't want to uh, have our residents uh, have to climb upstairs to get to bed. So we were able to um, uh, work with them to create uh, custom floor plans that would make sure that all the uh, bedrooms were on the, the floor level. So um, since each 
Home Arise fully completed, it just takes months instead of years to build out the entire site. And so once the universe, the uh, residents are um, placed in their foundation and the utilities are connected, they're ready for people to move into. Also, we, uh, we included uh, uh, abundant common areas and an organic gardening, gardening space, which uh, with Indy um, just uh, showcased very, very uh, dramatically. Um, so uh, with, with these uh, features, uh, the site is designed to build a sense of community and uh, enhance the resident's ability to pursue uh, educational and employment opportunities. Um, so when all is said and done, of course, uh, ecohood is not a, a, silver, a silver bullet for ending homelessness, uh, but it is one item in the toolbox of solutions from preserving low-income housing inventory to adaptive reuse of vacant or under, underutilized properties, permanent supportive housing, and other innovative home building methods. Um, we were uh, uh, developed without public uh, sources, the EcoHood pilot project was crafted as a template for easing LA's housing shortage by opening up city-owned land for development. Uh, so kind of uh, like, like Robin, we're looking at this as a proof of concept, uh, hopefully that City Hall will take notice of and uh, start to use uh, some of its vast inventory of properties to be developed for housing. Uh, one of the things that uh, we had heard from some of the uh, council members that we'd spoken to early about uh, using city-owned property, property told us that uh, when they inquire about that, a lot of times they're told that, well, it's an odd shape, uh, it's a weird configuration, so you really can't build on it. Uh, but as, as you probably could see from our slide, our aerial slide in particular, uh, a site doesn't get uh, much uh, more odd shape than the one we're building on. Uh, so so um, at present, um, it seems like LA city and county are focused on permanent supportive housing in addition to temporary fixes such as uh, emergency shelters and programs uh, like a bridge home and project room key that uh, rarely uh, help people exit homelessness uh, permanently. Um, so in our opinion, what's desperately needed is uh, lasting low cost housing for the majority of homeless Angelinos who are able-bodied but down on their luck due to lost jobs or costly car repairs or medical emergencies or uh, uh, some of the other unforeseen circumstances that uh, can all of a sudden put uh, a really crimp on uh, people's ability to uh, uh, pay for housing. Um, so um, Ecohood really is one way to address this omission in LA's homeless policy. And um, for additional, uh, anybody wants to know more about EcoHoods and uh, what we're doing, you can certainly go to LA CAN's website at uh, cangress, C-A-N-G-R-E-S-S -S dot O-R-G. Um, and that's uh, EcoHood in a nutshell. Great, wow, that's really fascinating. And Alan, I'm just curious, um, so you said the land you got at no cost, but what, how are you financing the construction of those micro units? With donations, we've had a number of fundraisers. Uh, LA CAN's annual Freedom Awards uh, this year was a, a virtual show that uh, included um, uh, speakers, entertainers, and live performances from various locations. And we've also, uh, once people hear about the concept, we've been getting calls from foundations and uh, private philanthropists who want to contribute. Um, some of them have uh, uh, proposed the idea of, well, can, uh, can I buy a unit? Can I sponsor a, a, a specific uh, a micro home? Um, so right now, uh, without uh, having to tap any of the uh, traditional funding sources, we've been able to uh, raise the funds. And um, now that the uh, pandemic has uh, opened up our ability to start uh, moving again, we uh, hope to be able to complete this site and uh, have uh, enough of a funding um, uh, backlog of, of people that we can tap if uh, we uh, decide to do additional developments. Mm -hmm. That's wow, that's really wonderful. And in terms of the rental subsidies, are, are you getting project based subsidies or how, how is the ongoing rental subsidy working? Um, you know, um, as I mentioned, this is our first time as a developer. So um, we're uh, not trying to bite off more than we can chew. 
and uh, we are um, certainly uh, talking to uh, uh, housing operators um, whose philosophy is consistent with our vision of uh, housing as a human right. So uh, that, uh, that's one area that we definitely um, are in the process of analyzing. Um, some, um, uh, some, uh, eco, uh, excuse me, some tiny home villages around the country have actually uh, initiated plans where the uh, monthly rent uh, goes towards uh, eventually purchasing the, uh, the home. So there's a, there's a, a lot of ways to, uh, to do it. And um, eventually, um, the, the goal, of course, uh, as far as uh, uh, rent responsibilities, we would uh, definitely try to uh, make sure that it was no more than 30% of someone's income. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, interesting. Well, that, that's really great, Ellen, and we're really excited to see how that project comes to fruition. It's certainly giving us a lot of hope that there are um, more innovative ways to build affordable housing. Um, some of us here, including Abode and National Corps and Community Corp, we certainly have been building in more of a traditional model where you cobble together different governmental funding sources and it can take many years and there are also a lot of design constraints. And so um, that's one thing that I think has sparked some interest is, um, you know, is there an opportunity to maybe, you know, um, revisit some of those constraints, you know, whether it be financial constraints or design constraints so that we can be more efficient. So one of the common themes I heard through all these presentations, I, I think we all agree that, you know, building housing that is as sustainable as possible with the focus on the wellness of the people living there is, is obviously something I think we all believe in. The question is, how do we really, um, how do we do that in, a, in an environment where we're constantly combating, you know, cost containment. Um, so I'm just curious if any of you have some insights, you know, maybe Fernanda, because you've worked in Brazil or anybody really, what do you think um, offers the best bang for the buck in terms of building affordable housing that's sustainable? Yeah, that's what it, that's our whole uh, fight <laughs> to build, uh, the, to build for a lower cost. That's the only way for uh, a private um, um, subsidies, you know, for, for people to that don't have public subsidies to uh, be able to charge less for the affordable housing. So I think we really look into like the, what we learned from uh, how things are built in Brazil, in Mexico, in Latin America, in, in poor countries. Um, so I, I do think like monolithic materials, um, that are also more sustainable to be disassembled later. So that's why we are thinking about this concrete box coverts, like how can you make construction, like gain on, on uh, establishing less layers for construction, you know, less trades usually takes, uh, just by building standard houses, you notice that when you put more trades in, this, in the project, then you get more, less savings. So how do you, minimize trades in construction. Um, so we are trying to take um, all of those lessons that we learned with construction uh, in Latin America and see how we can apply to make it more affordable here. That's, that's great. And Tim, I know you are really focused on economics with regard to, you know, being able to sell to your company, um, building very highly sustainable, affordable housing. So can you just share a couple of takeaways or lessons learned as you've been kind of embarking on that? You're on mute. Thanks. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. So um, National Core uh, has, has ventured down the modular path. So we, we built a, uh, I think it's 120 unit senior project in Yucca Valley uh, about four years ago that was modular. Um, and we were, we're, we're, we're pragmatic uh, problem solvers and uh, you know, cost containment is, is at the top of our list for, for solving problems. Um, the problem with modular as we saw it is uh, once you go in with the strategy, you, you do not have a plan B that is easy to exit. So if you have a problem with your, uh, your crate builder, your box builder, and those boxes don't show up to on site on a particular day or something happens, 
you don't have somebody else that you can go to. So um, we worked through that and we actually had that problem happen in our project. Uh, and when everything was said and done and we, we priced what we were building, it was more expensive to build modular than it was uh, a conventional stick frame. Our approach is, is like the modular builders uh, out there, the stuff that Robin showed, um, we standardized our units. So, um, you know, if you look at a lot of the, um, you know, the production developers who've been out there for a long period of time, they take that um, discretion out of the hands of the architects. The architects, for whatever reason, are showing up every single project and thinking they need to reinvent the wheel. I've got the best new unit for you. Look at this. Have you ever thought of this? It's like, yeah, we've been doing it for 30 years. We, we kind of know. So once you've solved the problem and you control your widget, what you like to build, then you understand cost. And the unknown in this whole market is the cost to build. If you can take out the variation in design and you know how to stack your buildings and you know what your vertical construction costs are, then the only variation that you're going to have to, to deal with are, are fluctuations in material pricing. So, so we've, we've sort of taken this venture down. We're looking at modular. We're exploring modular with some other developers who we're partnering with. Um, I see Ryan Lehman out there. I know Ryan uh, has been looking at this for a long time and we're looking at, at partnerships with those guys to try to solve this. But we're looking at other things too. Like we're, 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 we're trying to be we're the first multifamily builder to build out of bamboo, panelized bamboo. So we, we think that is, holds a, a lot of promise to really levelize the cost and take fluctuations like lumber spikes uh, out of the equation. And then the last thing is, is you need to understand the energy code and you need to understand the rebates that are out there to make your housing more affordable. Um, if you show up and you design any old building and the energy code has changed and they say, ta-da, you get rigid insulation on the exterior of your building and nobody asks any questions and explored this, you're probably gonna blow about $250,000 in your 50 unit project by making the wrong decision on the first day. So, so we understand that we, we use the energy modeling process as a conceptual design tool early on to figure out what our budgets are. And then I run operational economics on the first day. And I say, how much more can you borrow if your utility bills uh, for common areas go from $40,000 down to $5,000? So, mm -hmm. so, and that drives the architectural process. And I, I'm convinced that it's going to lead us, you know, closer and closer to these carbon neutral solutions that are affordable. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so interesting. And I totally agree with what you're trying to do here. And it'll be interesting to see how this bamboo thing works out. So please, you know, come back and share with us. Um, Robin, I'm curious at Abode, have you all tried the panelized systems like Fernando was talking about? Like where it's just, you know, part of the building is panelized or are you just focusing on completely modular? Panelized construction in the past on, um... I think our, our first development was our Casa Dominguez project in, uh, in uh, uh, um, uh, East Rancho uh, Dominguez. Uh, so it's an unincorporated LA County. Um, you know, Tara, I have to think about whether or not for our, um, you know, projects that are in construction right now, if we're using the, the same approach. So, you know, we're still doing traditional stick build as well. Um, and about, I would say about half of our portfolio. And, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, my hope is that we'll continue to see that, that cost savings that I reflected in my PowerPoint. But I think part of this is over time, um, which is if we can prove that there is enough demand in the affordable housing industry for modular construction, um, I think we'll de and there's less risk, like even that risk that, that Tim talked about. It's like if you're only dealing with one group that's producing your work, there's there's risk associated with that, and there's you know cost that's connected to it. But if we can get sort of more to, more like the the hotel industry, which uses you know modular construction on a lot of their work, so being able to scale it up, being standardized in what we do. I think we'll we'll experience higher cost savings, and then over time, since you know, as we all know, one of our biggest costs is labor. If you can contain that to a, you know, a business, a factory, as opposed to have it fluctuate with, you know, what's going on in the market too much, and maybe that's an opportunity to see um, savings as well. 
Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And I also think there's some really exciting opportunities with some of the things that were mentioned, like 3D printing. We don't know where that's going to go. Um, I know cross laminated timber is something that's being explored, although I think it's still a little bit expensive right now. But again, I think as we all sort of try to get used to some new ideas here, maybe there will build more demand and we can get the pricing a little bit more reasonable. So that, that's great, Robin. Um, so we do want to leave some time for questions. Q&A from the audience and I, I see a little bit of a chat going on here about density and I certainly understand and have mapped out how density actually does reduce your costs um, because you can spread out fixed costs over more units so definitely um, you know I, I see benefit in trying to build more density for sure and I think there are some sweet spots um, depending on the type of projects but why don't we go ahead and um, see what questions people have and I don't know um, Leonora did you want to let people on you and ask their question or how do you want to do this? Um, I think people should just use the Q&A button. I see one um, that was submitted in the chat earlier. The question is, what is the maximum square footage of modular units? Uh, can they have windows on the sides of units? Is it difficult, long, expensive to tow them down from NorCal? Do they fit together precisely on site? Sounds like something maybe Robin could answer. Yeah, those are those are all great press questions. Um, so, so on the developments that we're looking at right now, um, they're all you know. I think we got to like less than three hundred and fifty square foot efficient units that we're looking at on on the projects that we're doing with the HHH, um, and those are pretty standard. Um, on our other projects, those are um, multifamily. So these are all efficiencies, as I said. On the other ones, we're doing multifamily. So we're doing two, uh, one, two, three bedroom units. And we are definitely having to figure out how, again, we, we design and build those in the most efficient manner possible. Um, so, you know, I have found and, and looked at the modular construction that you can still get things like you know, good circulation, good good uh, um, light, and those things within the, the the design. So you can sort of think about where to to situate um, windows and things like that. So there are different unit types you can do, but I think the the benefit to doing modular construction is keeping those those unit types as consistent as possible. And so instead of having you know six unit types, you may only have three for each, or excuse me, one or two for each of the unit sizes. Yeah, and I think that was one thing we discovered that there's a way to optimize modular so that it can work better cost wise and um, we had done a design um, for a small modular project and it came in more expensive than stick build and I think that's because the design just wasn't optimized so certainly there are little tweaks and lessons we're learning along the way to really try to get it there. Um, and I, from what I understand, you could put any skin on them. So you can put windows yes. anywhere, you can make them lead platinum. So I, I do think that, you know, once we all figure out modular, it really does have opportunity to help our industry bring the cost down. Um, great. Uh, what I, Leonor, I, there was one um, sort of quick, straightforward question about land, but certainly we're competing on the open marketplace for land. Um, and that's a real challenge, especially as land prices have gone up so much. Um, so we're certainly looking at partnerships with faith-based organizations. And um, we found that there are some potential mutually um, synergistic relationships there with faith-based groups that might be willing to you know, take a discount or so we can build affordable housing. So, um, and I think Robin, you've also done that as well, right? Or with the school district or with faith-based groups. That's correct. We have, yeah. uh, land is, um, you know, pretty significant cost and it's rare unless you're working with the city that you're uh, getting donated land. So those types of collaboration partnerships with landowners who are willing to do you know, ground leases that are, you know, deeply discounted, it, it helps to bring your overall uh, total cost down. Right. But unfortunately, one thing we see is because we're competing on the open marketplace, we typically have to pay asking price or above to try to be the successful bidder. So it's really a no win situation for us there. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Other questions, Leonora, anything else? Yeah, we just got a question come in. Uh, it's a, it has some comments and then a question. It says, we need zoning reform. Our LA commercial boulevards are at a density of FAR 1.5 to 1, which is ridiculous. In 1986, our C2 boulevards were 3 to 1. 
we need to reform our zoning as a social equity solution. We also need codes that incentivize micro units, shared housing, shared kitchens, shared bathrooms. Is any panelist developing shared housing models? I will say no, and the reason is because our funding sources aren't really geared towards that. So, um, you know, because we're so heavily dependent, we need to follow their regulations, which do not currently allow for shared housing. So that's a bit of a conundrum. I, I, anyone else have a different answer? <laughs> oh, I think that's that's the definitely one of the reasons we are looking into uh, this um, affordable by design model is that you can make those changes, right? There is no regulations for that. So uh, all the projects we are proposing are micro units because close to city centers in the small infill lots, that's what you should be building um, overall. And, and they can be more affordable because you build less. So that's a huge cost savings with less square footage. Um, yeah, so that's a, I completely agree with Angie that we need to change that and in the regulations and people should be able to build more micro units. Right, yeah, a lot of um, not only do the funding regulations, but many cities have minimum square footage sizes and so that that really does hamper our ability to innovate. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions, Leonora? I'll ask a question. Um, I'd love to hear the panelists thoughts on parking, reducing parking, and whether that contributes to cost savings and uh, um, more sustainable buildings potentially. I will say that on the, the work that we're doing, we are definitely taking advantage of the city of, of Los Angeles permanent supportive housing ordinance and we are doing zero parking uh, in, our, in our permanent supportive housing developments. I think we're putting in a few spaces for staff and for um, you know, both on the property management side and on the services side, but really going to zero parking on the residential piece. Uh, and, if, and absolutely it, it reduces, um, reduces cost if you're not building, you know, either, <laughs> and, and again, typically we're doing subterranean or some type of parking structure. And if we're not building, you know, you know, 40 parking stalls were able to build way more housing and it's less expensive. Right, yeah, and I think for PSH, it's definitely much easier for permanent supportive housing. Um, for regular affordable housing, it's a little more of a challenge. People wanna have a parking spot. So we just built a brand new senior housing, affordable housing project in Santa Monica. And some people have actually turned the units down, even though there's a rooftop with an ocean view. <laughs> but because we only have 0.25 to one parking, we've had at least 10 people turn down units because, and this is for senior housing. so. <laughs> I, I was, you know, so I understand families have to cart their kids around, but even seniors are still car dependent. So that it, so I think there's just a difference there that we need to figure out. What about you, Tim, at National Corps? What are you all doing? So I'd say that just keep an eye on this because we're, we're still studying it. We, we don't have any no parking sites, but what we're seeing in our, our PSH is uh, once you provide uh, secure housing, uh, the next step is is hopefully security and a job, and along with that comes the need to be independent and mobile. So um, we're finding that some of our properties are that we were parking one half to one are now overparked, and people are struggling. So I think it's an ongoing battle. It 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 probably will eventually tie to reduced costs for transit and alternative forms of transportation. You know, I'm a big fan of uh, of you know electric bikes. As you can see over my shoulder, there's my electric bike. Uh, you know, trying to give residents other choices. Um, I think with PSH units, that's one of the things that we've got to keep our eye on. I think uh, knee jerking into saying no housing will work in dense areas like LA and San Francisco and other areas where people are trying to make a transition and and do other things in their lives. That that mobility is part of the transition. Alan, I'd love to hear about. Um whether EcoHood is taking any um, parking reductions or, or what the parking situation is planned there. Alan, are you still there? Oh, maybe he oh, jumped yeah, off. Yeah, maybe, yeah. 
Yeah. We, oh, well, we are pushing end, time, Leonora. Do we have time for one more question or do we need to wrap? Um, we don't have any other questions in the, in the Q&A box, so I think we can just wrap it up here. Um, and I, I just want to personally express appreciation to all the panelists. Um, thank you so much for participating in this. I thought, you know, this was really interesting. I learned a lot and I loved all the, the different perspectives that you're bringing to, you know, this challenge of housing innovation. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Have everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Job, Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you.